Chapter Two of The Outspan by J. Percy Fitzpatrick. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sally McConnell. Chapter Two Saltke, an incident of the Delagoa Road. We were transport riders trekking with loads from Delagoa Bay to Leidenburg, trekking slowly through the hot, bushy low felt, doing our fifteen to twenty miles a day. The roads were good and the rates were high, and we were happy. Toward sundown two of us strolled on ahead, taking the guns in hopes of picking up a guinea-fowl, or a stem-buck, or some other small game, leaving the wagons to follow as soon as the cattle were inspanned. We shot nothing. In fact, we saw nothing to shoot. It was swelteringly hot, as it always is there until the red sun goes down and all things get a chance to cool. It was also very dusty, two or three inches of powdery dust under our feet, which whipped up in little swirls at the least breath of air. I was keeping an eye on the scrub on my side for the chance of a bush pheasant, and not taking much notice of the road, when my companion pulled up with a half-suppressed exclamation, and stood staring hard at something on ahead. "'Durn my skin!' he said slowly and softly as I came up to him. He was a slow-spoken Yankee. "'Say, look there! Don't it beat hell!' In the direction indicated, partly hidden by the scant foliage of a thorn-tree, a man was sitting on a yellow portmanteau reading a book. The sight was unusual, and it brought the unemotional Yankee to a standstill and set us both smiling. The man was dressed in a sort of clerk's everyday get-up, even to the bowler hat, and as he sat there he held overhead an old black silk umbrella to protect him from such of the sun's rays as penetrated the thorn-bush. He must have become conscious of the presence of life by the subtle instinct which we all know and can't explain, for almost immediately he raised his glance and looked us straight in the eyes. He rose and came towards us, laying aside the umbrella, but keeping his place in the book. The scene was too ludicrous not to provoke a smile, and the young fellow, he could not have been above twenty-three, mistaking its import, raised his hat politely and wished us good afternoon. He spoke English, but with a strong German accent and his dress, his open manner, his ready smiles, and, above all, his politeness, proclaimed him very much a stranger to those parts. Key murmured a line from a compatriot, Green peas has come to market, and vegetables is riz. You have come mit a wagons? You make de transport, not? he asked us, following up the usual formula. We told him it was so and that we were for the fields, and reckoned to reach Matulla by sun-up. He too, he said, was going to the gold fields, and would be a prospector. He was just waiting for his boy, who had gone back for something he had forgotten at the last place. He was going to walk to Moody's, he said. He did make mid one transporter a contract to come by wagons, but it was a woman mid two childs what was leave behind, and there was no more wagons, so we will walk. It was good to walk, to make him strong for the prospect. Oh, yes. We were used to meeting all sorts on the road, and they were pretty well all inclined to talk. But this one was so full it just bubbled out of him, and in his broken English he got off question on question, between times imparting scraps of information about himself and his hopes. He was clearly in earnest about his future, and he was so utterly unpractical so hopelessly astray in his view of everything, that one could not but feel kindly towards him. We chatted with him until our wagons came up, when he again politely raised his hat, and he said good-bye to us, and offered many thanks for the information about the road. As we moved on with the wagons, he turned to look down the road by which we had come, and said apparently as an afterthought, "'You have seen my boy, perhaps? Not? No. So... Goodbye, yes, goodbye. It does not take long for daylight to glide through dusk into darkness in the bushveld in South Africa, 
and even these few minutes spent in conversation had seen the light begin to fade from the sky as the sun disappeared. The road was good and clear of rocks and stumps, so we hopped onto the most comfortable wagon and talked while the oxen plodded slowly along. We had quite a large party that trip, for, besides Gowan and myself, who owned the wagons, we had three traders from Swazi country, old friends of ours who had come down to Delagoa to buy goods. We had all arranged to stand in together in a big venture of running loads through Swaziland to the gold fields later on in the season. In fact, the trip we were then making was more or less a trial one to see how the land lay and how much we could venture in the big coup. Gowan, the other transport rider, and I always travelled together. We were not partners exactly, but in a country like that it was good to have a friend, and we understood each other. There were no two ways about him. He was a white man through and through. The two Mackays were brothers. They had left Scotland some years before to join a farming scheme, suitable for gentlemen's sons with a little capital, as the circular and advertisement said. They had given it best, however, and gone trading long before I met them. The other member of our party was the one with whom I had been walking. He was an American, and had been everything and everywhere, most lately a trader in Swazi country. We generally called him the judge. As the wagons rumbled along, Key was giving a more or less accurate account of our conversation with the stranger. It was very amusing, even more amusing than the original, for I am bound to say that with him a story did not suffer in the telling. It was only Gowan who didn't seem to see anything to laugh at in the affair. He sat there dangling his legs over the buck rails, chewing a long grass stalk, and humming all out of tune. He had a habit of doing that, growling with it. Presently, as conversation flagged, the tune got worse, and his growling took the shape of a reference to giving a poor devil a lift. I frankly confessed that I simply had not thought of it, and that was all. As, however, Gowan continued growling about beastly shame, and poor devil of a greenhorn, etc., Key answered dryly, Well, I did think of it, but, first place, they ain't my wagons. Gowan grunted out, Damn rot! And second place, continued Key placidly, considering the kind of cargo you got aboard, and where it's going to, I didn't reckon you wanted any passengers. I don't want passengers, said Gowan gloomily. But any darn fool knows that that fellow will never see food or blankets or boy again on the face of God's earth. Kaffir carriers don't forget things at outspans. No, not any that I've seen, and I've seen a good few. Old Gowan took up the grass stem again and chewed and tugged at it, and made occasional kicks at passing bushes by way of showing general and emphatic disapproval. No one said anything. It was Gowan's way to growl at everything, and nobody ever took much notice. He was the most good-natured, kindly old growler that ever lived. He growled as some sturdy old dogs do when you pat them. They like it. In this particular case, of course, he had reason. It is not that we were unhospitable or unfeeling, but years of roughing it had, I suppose, dulled our impressions of the first night alone in the felt, and we had not seen it as Gowan did. Life of the sort we led, no doubt, develops the sterling good qualities of one's nature, but quick sympathy and its delicate traits are rather growths of refinement and quiet and it betrayed no real want of feeling that we had not taken Gowan's view. There could be no doubt, of course, that the Kaffir boy had bolted with the blankets and food, for we had noticed that the young German had nothing left when we saw him but that yellow portmanteau, and our knowledge of the Delagoa Bay boy forbade acceptance of the theory that he had gone empty-handed. We rumbled heavily along for a bit, and after a while, Gowan resumed, in a tone of deeper grumbling, and more surly dissatisfaction than before. Like as not, the silly fool will lose himself looking for water and die in the bush, like that one Joe Roberts brought up last season. Why, I remember when— Graver the prophet! exclaimed Robbie, starting up in mock alarm. 
He's going to tell us that dismal yarn about the parson chap who hunted beetles and was found after a week's search with two of his most valuable specimens feeding on his eyes. Skip, Sonny, skip, and fetch up your German friend for the old man gets under way. Key dropped off the buck rails as the drivers shouted their on horse to the cattle to give them a breather, kicked his legs loose a bit, dusted down his trousers quietly, and smiling good-humouredly at Gowan, guessed it was better business to hump that gripsack a mile or two than listen to old Yuxke's prayers. That was his irreverent way of alluding to Gowan's calling of transport rider, a Yuxke being part of the trek gear. Key and I set out together at a brisk pace, well knowing how poor was the chance of catching up to the wagons again before the midnight outspan. Key, who was always tickled by Gowan's growling tones, remarked after we had walked for some minutes, Sling hell like a nigger parson, you know, can the old un, but soft and harmless as a woman. After half an hour's brisk walking, we caught the unsteady flicker of a fire through the straggling thorns, and we found our friend sitting tailor-wise before it, making vigorous but futile attempts to whisper beside the smoke that would go his way. His look of mild curiosity at the sound of our voices wakened up into welcome when he recognised us, and he at once became interested in the reason of our return. "'You have lose something, not? I too will look for you,' he said, jumping up eagerly, but we reassured him on that point and inquired in turn whether his boy had returned and cross-questioned him as to the when and wherefore of his leaving. The Kaffir-bearer, he said, had left him that morning during the after-breakfast trek. Ten hours gone by, Jimmy,' muttered the judge. "'And you have waited here since then?' I asked. "'Oh, yes, yes. I read to learn the English. It is, had any scarf?' "'Please?' "'Had any grub, anything to eat or a drink?' explained Key, illustrating his meaning by graphic touches on mouth and belt. No, no, I am not hunger. Also, it is good that I eat not. It make me use for the prospect. Key smiled gently, and said with a quaint judicial air, Well, I don't know as that's quite necessary. But if you can stick it out till that nigger of yours comes back, I guess you'll do for most any camp you'll strike in this country. Say, has he got the blankets? Yes. And the grub? So. And, er, uh, maybe you gave him money as well? I have give him one pound to pay the passport, which he forgot. He say policeman will take him if he shows not the ticket. But he will come bring to me the change. He is a good boy, and he speak an English for good. But perhaps something can happen, and that policeman have taken him, I think. Even in a newcomer such credulity was a revelation. I could not help smiling, but the judge's clear-cut, impassive features never changed. Only, at the mention of the boy's lingual accomplishments, he winked solemnly at me. The judge brought matters to a practical issue by telling our friend that he had much better wait at our wagons for the good boy that speaks English so well. It ain't, said Key, as if he couldn't find ye. A Kaffir can find you almost anywhere if he wants to, specially them English-speaking ones, he added with a twinkle in his eyes. Key did not wait for any reply, but turned the yellow gripsack over and looked at the name. Adolf Saltke, printed in big white letters. Your name? he asked in chaff, rather than that he doubted it. My name, yes, Saltke. Adolf Saltke. Come from Germany, but in the colony I was little times. "'Took you for an American,' said the judge, without a vestige of a smile. I looked hastily at Saltke, feeling that his broken, halting English should have protected him from such outrageous fooling, but my solicitude was misplaced. Saltke, calmly but firmly, disclaimed all knowledge of America, and repeated that he was a German. Key shouldered the portmanteau with the curt suggestion, "'Well, let's get,' and as our friend— except by his protestations of gratitude and wild endeavours to carry the whole of the kit himself, offered no hindrance to the proposed scheme, we marched along briskly to overtake the wagons. A bullock wagon is a slow one to travel with, but a bad one to catch, as any one knows who has tried it. 
and it was close on midnight when, tired and dusty, we came suddenly on the wagons outspanned in a small opening in the bush. The silence was absolutely ghostly, except when now and then a bullock would give a big long sigh, or a sappy stick in the fire would crack and hiss. Gowan was sitting over the fire on a three-legged rough wood stool, head in hands and elbows on knees, with the odd jets of flame lighting up his solemn old face and shaggy brown beard. The others had turned in. He stood up slowly as we came up, and extended a hand to Sotka, saying boldly, "'How are you?' Our friend took the inquiry in a literal sense, and was engaged in answering it, when Garn cut in with the remark that it was time to be in bed, and, accepting his own hint, he hooked his finger on the rimpy of his camp-stool, and strode off to where his blankets were already spread under one of the wagons. As he turned, he pointed with his foot to the fire, growling out that there was a billy of tea and some stew warming up for him, looking back at Saltka and adding, Bread's in the grub box. Night! He turned in. It was just like him to remember these things, for in our routine there was a rule, no eating during the night outspan. It was breakfast after the morning trek, and supper before the evening one. Gowan had also thrown out a couple of blankets, and between us we made up pretty well for the lost bedding, so Saltke was installed as one of the party. It says something for him that in spite of our eight-mile walk and that yellow portmanteau, the verdict under our wagons that night was, Seems a decent sort, after all, and it would have been a bit rough to leave him to shift for himself. Saltke's stupendous greenness should have disarmed chaff, and indeed, as first we all felt that fooling him was like misleading a child, there was no fun to be got out of it. He believed anything that was told him. He accepted literally those palpable exaggerations which are not expected or wanted to be believed. He took for gospel the account of the Munchausen of the Bushveld, who told how his team of donkeys had been disturbed by a lion during the early morning trek, and how, to his infinite surprise and alarm, he found that the savage brute had actually eaten his way into one donkey's place, and when day broke was found still pulling in the team, to the great dismay of the other members. He was anxious to make a personal experiment of the efficacy of dew taken off a bullock's horn, which we had recommended as an infallible snake charm. At considerable risk he had secured the dew, and the scene of Saltke's struggling with the bewildered bullock at early dawn one morning was one to be remembered. However, he pledged himself to not carry the experiment further without the assistance of one of us, and a day or two later we removed immediate risk by losing his file of dew. I am convinced that he would have tried the experiment on any snake he might have met, and with absolute confidence as to the result. His mind was such as one would expect in a child who had known neither mental nor physical fear. He seemed absolutely void not only of personal knowledge of evil, but even of that cognizance of its existence which shows itself in a disposition to seek corroborative evidence, to consult probabilities, and to inquire into motives. I am convinced that Saltke never questioned a motive in his life, nor ever hesitated to accept as a fact anything told in apparent seriousness. Irony and sarcasm were to him as to a child or a savage. He was intensely literal, single-minded, and direct, and perfectly fearless in thought, word, or act. Such a disposition in a child would have been charming. In a well-set-up, active young man of three-and-twenty or so, it was embarrassing. Donald Mackay, who was of a choleric disposition, complained a day or two after Saltke joined us that, why, he was blanked if he could blank well stand it. Why, that morning— when he was about to give one of the boys a lamb based in, the kiddie turns white as a girl with the first swear in sight of the shambok, and I tell ye, mon, I was nigh to bustin with the drawing room blether I was gettin off. It was quite true. Saltke was not shocked, nor affecting to be shocked at the vigorous language he heard. He was simply unlearned in it, and shrank as a girl might from the outburst of violence. Gradually the feeling of strangeness wore off, and the restraint which the new presence had imposed was no longer felt except on odd occasions. On our side we chaffed and shook him up, partly on the impulse of the time, and partly with good-natured intent, 
to make him better fitted to take care of himself among the crowd with whom he would mix later on. On his side, he had never felt restraint, and of course rapidly became familiar with us in our ways, and seemed thoroughly to enjoy the chaff and his initiation into the system of good-humoured imposture. With all his greenness, he was no fool. In fact, he was, in odd, unexpected ways, remarkably shrewd and quick, as he often showed in conversation. He was, moreover, a poor subject for practical jokes, and several of the stock kind recoiled on the perpetrators, because, as I have said, he did not know what fear was. When a notorious practical joker named Evans, with whom we had travelled in company for a couple of days, put up the lion scare on Saltke, it didn't come off. He asked our young friend to dine at his wagons on the other side of a dry donga, and after telling the most thrilling lion yarns all the evening, left Saltke to walk back alone, while he slipped off to where lay him at the darkest and deepest part of the donga. There was the rustle of bushes and sudden roar which had so often played havoc before, but Saltke only stepped back and lunged out in unfamiliar fashion with a long revolver which no one knew he carried. Ignoring the fact that a lion could have half eaten him in the time expended, Saltke calmly cocked the weapon, and, to the terror of his late host, poured all six barrels into the bush from which the noise had come. He then retreated quietly out of the donga to where we, hearing the shots and Evan's shouts of terror, had run down to see what was up. Saltke was excited, but quiet, and the noise of the reports had evidently prevented him from detecting the man's voice. He said, "'It was something what make her by me, and I shoot, but I have no more cartridge.' We did not see Evans again for some months. The story of Saltke's lion made the road too hot for him that winter. When we told Saltke the real facts, his face was a study. For some days he was very quiet and thoughtful. He was completely puzzled, and for the life of him could not imagine the motive that had actuated Evans.' nor could he, on the other hand, realise the possibility of any one acting differently from the way in which he had done. Before this there had been some horseplay when we were crossing the Kamati River. The stream was running strong, and was then from four to five feet deep at the drift, and although it was known to be full of crocodiles, there was little or no danger at the regular crossing. However, Key had primed Saltke with some gorgeous stories of hair-breadth escapes, intending to play a trick on him in the river. "'It's quite a common thing for men to be carried off here,' said the judge. "'But white men are very seldom killed, not more than four or five a year, because of the boots.' "'Boots!' exclaimed Sodka inquisitively. "'Yes,' said Key, in half-absent tones. "'If you kick properly, no crack can stand it.' Sodka complained excitedly, as though he had suffered gross injustice that no one had told him this interesting phase of life on the road. But Key snubbed him, telling him that men didn't speak much of such matters, as it gave the impression of bragging. Saltke, who was above all things desirous of conforming with the etiquette of the road, asked no more questions, but Key, later on in the day affecting to relent a little, got Saltke to sit straddle legs on the pole of one of the wagons, and there, under his directions, practice kicking crocodiles. The crossing was too difficult for one span of oxen, so we double-spanned, and put all hands on with whips and shamboks along the thirty oxen to whack and shout until we got through. Key placed himself behind Saltke, and just when the excitement was greatest, with his long whipstick and lash he made a loop in which he managed to enclose Saltke's legs. One jerk took him clean off his feet, and downstream he went, floundering and kicking for dear life, for he believed a crocodile had him. His kicking, when he was head downwards, and his legs were free of the water, was remarkable. There were roars of laughter from everyone, as Key passed the word along, but presently there was a lull, and the niggers stopped laughing, and felt the joke fall flat, when Saltke, utterly unconscious of the real cause of his upset, waded deliberately back as soon as he had recovered his feet, and, pale but undaunted, took his place, shambok in hand, the same as before. Among transport riders the condition of the berg, as the spurs of the long Drakensberg range of mountains are called colloquially, 
is always a fruitful topic of conversation. The berg at Spitzkop is worse than at any other point, I believe, and Saltke exhibited a growing interest in this much-discussed feature of the road. His enthusiastic nature led him here into all sorts of speculations about it, which were highly amusing to us, and the judge egged poor Saltke on, and crammed him, so that he undertook in our interest to devise some method for ascending this awful berg, whereby the then terrible risks to life and property would be minimised, if not entirely removed. The position, as Key explained it, was this. There was a long, steep hill to be surmounted, the grade of which varied between thirty degrees and vertical, but the crowning difficulty lay in the chute. Here it was an open question whether the hill did not actually overhang. So steep was it, in fact, that it was not an uncommon occurrence for the front oxen to slip as they gained the summit, and fall back into the wagon, possibly killing both leader and driver, and doing infinite damage to the loads. Saltke faced this problem brimful of confidence in the subject and himself. After hours of keen discussion and diligent experiments, Saltke produced his plan. It was a system of endless rope on guides and pulleys, so arranged that by a top anchorage on the summit of this hill, both oxen and driver would be secure. Saltke was triumphant, but Key extricated himself temporarily by pointing out that, as we had not enough rope to try the scheme, we would have to take the old roundabout road and leave the chute for the next trip. The joking with Saltke, as I have said, at times degenerated into common horseplay, and this led to the only unpleasantness we had. The younger Mackay, Robbie, was a quiet, humorous, and most gentle-natured fellow, an immense favourite with everybody. One night we were all standing round the fire when something occurred which nobody ever seemed able to explain. Saltke had mislaid his pipe, and, thinking he had seen Robbie take it, asked him for it back. Robbie denied all knowledge, and Saltke, deeming it but another practical joke, said, I saw you taking it, you using a term which he, poor chap, had picked up without knowing the meaning, a term which among white men never passes unnoticed. Robbie's Scotch blood was aflame, and before one of us could stir, before he himself could think of the allowances to be made, before the word was well said, a heavy right-hander across the mouth dropped Saltke back against the wagon. Blank amazement and something like consternation marked every face but none was so utterly taken aback as poor Saltke, who would have suffered anything rather than inflict pain upon a fellow being. He only said, Robbie, what have I say? I do not understand. And, looking white and miserable, walked quietly off to his blankets and turned in. To us it was though a girl, a child had been struck, and no one felt this more than Robbie himself as soon as he saw that the insult was not intentional. The look on Saltke's face was that of a stricken woman, a look of dull, unmerited pain. He was not cowed, just dazed and hurt, but inexpressibly hurt. You will see men blink and shuffle under that look on a woman's face. You will see a master quail before it in a servant. You will see white go down before it in black, for it is God's own weapon in the hands of helpless right. As long as I live I shall remember that look. I felt as though I had done it. We trekked as usual next morning at about three o'clock, and it must have been some time in the dark hours of the early trek that Robbie spoke to Saltke. Whatever it was, he said, it relieved the awkwardness, and restored Saltke to something of his old self. But he was never quite the same again, and for some days we did not get over the look in his eyes, and the feeling of guiltiness it left in us. Robbie did not speak of that early morning scene, but later in the day remarked incontinently, By God, he is white, is Saltke, white all through. Saltke kept a diary, and kept it with the most marvellous fidelity and unflagging industry, and he also learned to shoot, and shot cockyolly birds occasionally, and was pleased to know their sporting and scientific names. There is a sort of bastard cockatoo in those parts which is commonly known as the go-away bird, 
on account of its cry, which closely resembles these words, and of a habit it is supposed to have of warning game of the approach of man. In Saltke's diary there should be an elaborate essay on the ancestry and personal habits of this bird, and the wonderful traditions of its family. He took these things down faithfully and laboriously from the judge's own lips. The judge had a copious mythology. Poor Saltke tried to stuff some of his dicky birds, labelling them with such names as Key could always supply at a moment's notice. The result was unpleasant, as Saltke took to bestowing these ill-preserved relics in the side pockets of the tents, in the wagon boxes, and in a dozen other unlikely spots. It was only now and then that we could actually find them, but there was a constant suggestion of their proximity nevertheless. We took to calling Saltke the Professor, as it was a title which, we told him, seemed better to suggest an all-round efficiency than any other we could think of, and therefore suited him more than such purely departmental distinctions as leather stocking, the engineer, or the ornithologist. I had forgotten to say there was one thing on which we did not chaff poor Saltke. He played the zither. I do not know if he played it well or not, for he was the only one whom I have heard play that instrument. To us, lying round a bright thornwood fire, in which the big logs burnt into solid glowing coals, to us, who lay back smoking or gazing up into the infinite depths of silent, cloudless sky, watching millions and millions of stars twinkling busily and noiselessly down at us, the music was a kind of dream. As Saltke sat in the glow of the fire, and the unsteady flicker of shooting and dying flames threw lights and shadows on his face, it sometimes looked as though he was not quite what we took him for. His was a bright, intelligent face, lit up by quick, eager blue eyes. In fact, though it was a thing that we took no stock in, Saltke was really a very good-looking boy, and one naturally thought of him as some mother's hope and pride, and the look of worry and grief that I sometimes fancied I saw was put down to homesickness, brought out by music. However good or bad his music was, he seemed to feel it, and we, well, we never talked much after he began to play, and when he stopped, we generally knocked our pipes out with a sort of a half sigh, and turned in for the night. It used to make me think of home as I remembered it when I was still externally respectable, before I took to flannel shirts and moleskins and ways that were not home ways, and I expect the others felt that too. We had passed the Crocodile River and the belt of Tsetse fly country. We had passed Josie Kulu's, where Hart was murdered by the niggers, and we told Saltke the story of the dead man's sentry go. We passed Ship Mountain and pointed out the bush that hid the haunted cave, and told him the weird tradition of the old witch-doctor imprisoned by the rock-slide, handling still as a skeleton the implements of magic he used in life. All these things were noted in Saltke's voluminous diary, and a curious medley it must have contained with the embroidered facings of key and the solid square facts of Gowan intermingled with the author's own original remarks and reflections. Saltke, to do him justice, was clearly a person of some purpose. He had placed before himself an ideal, and he never lost sight of it. He was eternally qualifying for that pursuit which he called de prospect. He would eat from choice the charred and blackened crust of an overbaked loaf, or a steak that had slipped the gridiron and got well sanded. He also seemed to prefer the dregs of the coffee-billy, which he swallowed black and unsweetened. He scorned to use a fork, and he always slept on the lumpiest ground. And all this was to fit him for the hardships and emergencies he promised himself as a full-blown prospector. His eagerness for knowledge of the flora and fauna was equally remarkable. He had compiled a sort of dictionary of plants and animals, describing their virtues, medicinal or culinary, and I am sure that towards the end of our trip Saltke would have set out into the bush with a light heart, armed only with his book, and fortified by a confidence which was absolutely phenomenal. Looking back on it all, it seems a mean shame ever to have played on his credulity, and indeed most of us were, even at this time, keenly alive to this. 
but there were times when his eager questioning and intense earnestness about commonplace trifles made temptation irresistible, and seemed even to inspire one with ridiculous notions suited to Saltke's undiscriminating appetite. It was on a Sunday morning that we came in sight of Pretorius Corp, a solitary sugar-loaf hill, and we lay by, as usual, during the hours of daylight. We knew it was Sunday because Saltke had said so, and because we saw him, in the early morning, kneeling in the shadow of a big tree a few yards from the wagons, prayer-book in hand, absorbedly following the prayers of the Mass. He was a Roman Catholic, and was as uncompromisingly particular in observing the smallest detail of his church's ritual and teaching as he was by nature tolerant of the shortcomings of others. In the course of the morning's short excursion, Saltke had come across one of those crawling creatures known to children as Thousand Legs, the common harmless millipede. It was the first he had ever seen, and words failed him in his quest for information. Key was the first he met on his return, and the judge told him solemnly that the insect in question was that well-known and most ferocious of reptiles, the viper. During breakfast, Saltke absorbed whole volumes of information about this viper, its habits and uses, and as soon as the meal was over, he betook himself to the side pocket of the tent wagon, where the beloved diary was kept, and commenced to write up the new discovery. We were all spread about, enjoying the morning smoke, or taking it easy in other ways. We had forgotten Saltke, but presently his face popped out, wearing a most worried, earnest, and intense expression. "'George!' he called. "'George! How for dot viper spell?' Key dictated calmly. "'W. H.' Y-P-E-R. Wiper. And Saltke, with infinite pains, put it down. But we heard him a moment later from his place in the tent of the wagon, murmuring, Lieber Himmel, tot was an ugly name. He kept his diary in English, and many a perspiring hour did he spend in his struggles with our language. But he never quailed once, never even slackened, for he said it was good to make him friends meet the English, and he can talk him when he shall come on to prospect. Saltke could hardly have taken down the name of this new wonder, when the sight of a blue jay flying past, one marvellous blaze of gorgeous colour as its shiny feathers caught the sunlight, sent him into a perfect paroxysm of excitement. He had seen the honeysuckers, and knew them in the diary as birds of paradise. He knew the ordinary or cocky ollie bird as the small pheasant of Capricorn. He had shot dicky birds by the dozen and stuffed them, and their noxious odours seemed to add zest to his ornithological pursuits. But he had never seen, never dreamed of anything like this. For one spellbound moment, Saltke watched the bird sail by, and then gasped out, Gott in Himmel, what was dead? Christ, noch be still, und I shot him. Diary, pen, ink, and blotter were thrust aside, and Saltke scrambled for the gun. We turned our backs on him to watch the bird. Saltke jumped from the wagon. The report of the two barrels was so loud and close that it made us duck, but the blue jay sat unmoved. There was a curious silence that made several of us look round together. The gun had fallen and Saltke was standing above it, rigid and ghastly white, with one hand gripping a burnt and blood-spattered tear in his right leg. As we sprang to him, open-armed, he seemed just to sway gently towards us with closed eyes and a soft murmur of words in his own tongue. It sounded like a prayer. I think he fainted then, but we were never sure, as he was always so still with it all, that one couldn't tell at times whether he was dead or alive. The medicines we had, and the remedies we knew, did not run to gunshot wounds and broken legs, but we made shift to fix him up somehow with a rough ligament. It was here that Key came in. Quiet and self-possessed, firm and kind, he cut away the burnt, torn clothing. He washed out the ragged, blackened wound. He tied the leg and told us it was fractured, shattered and would have to come off. And Saltke lay there under the big tree, on a blanket spread on a heap of grass, 
as white as alabaster and as still, while we watched silently beside him, fanning him with small green boughs and keeping off the flies. Donald Mackay had started off at once for a doctor, but we knew that with the best luck in finding him, and riding day and night, it must be over two days before we could get him down there. Robbie went with his brother to the nearest wagons a few miles on ahead, where Donald raised a horse and went on alone on his long ride for help. Robbie came back with a few things that we hoped would help a little, and then we settled down to watch in silence the awful race between ebbing life and coming help. Through the hot, long, quiet day, we watched and tended him, and so on into the cool of the evening. We could do nothing, really, but it seemed to please him and us to whisk away the flies and say a word of cheer to him, or now and then to shift the cotton sheet that covered him. When the stars came out and the soft, cool feel of night grew up around, and the ruddy flicker of the fire worked its magic on the encampment, changing and beautifying everything with sudden lights and weird shadows, when the cattle were tied up to the yokes, and one by one lay down to sleep with great restful, deep-drawn sighs, when there were no sounds but the steady chewing of the cud, and the occasional distant howl of a hyena, or the sharp, unreal laugh of the jackal, then did we really seem to settle down to the business of waiting. Now and then, perhaps three or four times in the night, Saltke asked for water. Once or twice towards morning, he sighed a suppressed, tired sigh. But not a word of complaint, not a sign of impatience, not one evidence of the torture he was enduring escaped him. When morning came, cool and fragrant, and the blue smoke of the campfire curled up straight and clean into the pure air, he was as quiet and uncomplaining still, though not for one second had his eyes closed, nor the deadly numbing pain ceased its ache. Saltke seemed to me to look younger than ever, though terribly white and fagged. His eyes looked blue and brave and trustful, childishly trustful as ever and he alone, of all the party, did not keep looking towards the west for the return of Donald Mackay and his charge. All that day we watched and waited, and on through another slow and silent night. But we could see then that Saltke could not last out much longer without a doctor's help, and that his chance was becoming a poor one. It must have been about three in the morning, when, lying flat on my back, Looking up into the wonderful maze of stars that spatters our southern sky, I heard or felt the tiniest tap-tap-tap under my head. I shot up with the cry of, There's Donald at last! We were all up and listening, but could hear nothing when standing, of course. However, there was no mistake, and after five minutes we could hear on the cool, clear, still air the footfall of a horse one horse, as we all remarked, with an awful heart-sinking. Two of us, Key and I, went on to meet the horseman, and in a few minutes came upon Donald leading a horse upon which, by the aid of a propping arm, was balanced a man whom we all knew only too well. In a breath, Donald told us that he had sent on from the first camp for the district surgeon, but chancing on Doc Munro, had packed him on the horse and come back with him as a makeshift. Munro was a quack chemist of morose and brutal character, and a drunkard with it. His moral status might be gauged by the fact that no patient among those who knew him personally, or by repute, ever approached him professionally, except upon the contract system. So much the job, payment on delivery, cured. He had a certain repute for ability, God knows how it was earned, for he had killed more men than any other agency in the country, but I believe that his brutal and sardonic indifference to public opinion, his fiendish hints that there was no accident about the deaths of his patients, and that those who want Doc Munro can pay for him by God, inspired a weird dread which, irrationally perhaps, yet not unnaturally, begot a sort of blind, awed belief in the man's ability. Men hardly stricken have been known to sit on the bar-step and wait while Doc, 
having drunk himself drunk, would drink himself sober, and then, with implicit faith, swallow down mixtures to which the bloodshot eyes and the trembling hands of the dock added the interest of a blind gamble. By the uncertain light of the stars I had not recognised him until Key, who was a few paces in front, said softly, It's Doc Munro, dead drunk. Donald was utterly worn out and wild with despair. Doc had been drunk when he found him, but, as Donald said, he was always that, and he had hoped that a forty-mile ride would sober him. However, it seems that twice on the road he had got liquor, and the second time, when Donald had caught him and taken it away, he had sat down by the roadside, stolid and immovable, until the liquor was returned to him. There were reasons why we bottled up our rage and treated the dock with a show of civility and even conciliatory respect. We knew, firstly, that he had his instruments, and that only he could use them, and secondly, that, however drunk he might be, he never lost his senses until delirium set in and moreover that he was intensely suspicious of offence when in this state, and if once huffed was indifferent to prayers and threats alike. The look on Gowan's face was positively murderous when he saw in what manner our waiting was rewarded. I am sure he would readily have killed Munro at that moment. Poor Sotka showed his first signs of anxiety then, and we had to make what excuses we could. The want of light, first of all, and then the long ride to account for the doctor's not seeing him now that he had come. But the hours went by, the chance was ebbing away, and we could do nothing, absolutely nothing, with the man. We tried him with everything. We gave him black coffee. He wouldn't touch it. We tried soup. He kicked it over. Food, sleep, a bath, everything was rejected with a sullen and stolid shake of the head, and the one word, whisky. That we would not give. For four mortal hours the man lay sullenly by the wagon on a pile of blankets, and only the one word passed his lips. We dared not give him more. It would have destroyed our only chance, and without liquor he would not budge. Day was well advanced when Munro stood up quietly and walked over to where Gowan stood beside his wagon. I suspected that the doc had noticed Gowan's look when he came into camp with us, and now it was clear that he had. "'You think I'm drunk?' said Munro with a malignant sneer. "'I saw you look at me when I got off that darned horse. You think I'm drunk, do you?' Gowan looked him steadily in the eyes, but made no answer, and Doc resumed. "'Are you going to give me that whisky? Again no answer. But I walked nearer, as I could see Gowan's hands close and go back and his chest came up with hard breathing. "'Are you going to give me that whisky? asked Munro again, slowly and deliberately. "'No!' roared Gowan with a tiger-like spring at the other man. "'I'll see you in hell first. I caught Gowan's uplifted arm, but Munro never flinched, and pulling himself together with something of a shake, he said in a perfectly sober, even tone, and with diabolical malevolence. Then I'll see your friend dead and rotten before I stir a hand to help him. And with that he marched back to the blankets and lay down again. An hour passed, and he never stirred a finger, never even blinked his staring eyes. Then the Mackays, Key, and I held a council, and decided to give him the liquor as a last, a truly forlorn hope. It was left to me to see him, and I went over, bottle and glass in hand. He wouldn't touch it. I argued, begged and prayed, but it had no effect whatever. He just lay there, resting on one arm with the cruel, shallow glitter in his eyes that one sees in those of wild beasts. I returned to the others, and we had another talk, and then I offered him money, a price, all that we could give. That fetched him. He sat up and looked at me for about a minute, and then said, shaking with hate, "'Your liquor I won't touch. Your money won't buy me. As soon as it's cool enough to move, I go back. And if you've ever heard of Doc Munro, you'll take that for a last answer.' That was a facer. 
and when I went back and told the others, opinions were divided as to what to do. Gowan and Key were for the rifle cure. If he wouldn't operate, shoot him. But we urged another, a last delay, say till noon, and they gave way, but warned us it would be useless. The heat that day was awful. No breeze, no relief, only dead, oppressive heat, reflected to and fro the steel-blue sky and the hard-baked earth. The fires were out. We had cooked nothing that day, and the camp looked dead and deserted. One or more of us would always be with Saltka. The others would be lying in the shadow of a tree or under a wagon. We had some faint hope that the district surgeon would turn up, but not before the morrow, and knowing Saltka's condition, that seemed useless, so our only real chance was with Munro. As we lay there, dismally and hopelessly waiting, we were suddenly startled by a most peculiar and unnatural bark. The two dogs also jumped up and ran out onto the road. We could see nothing except that Munro had gone. The noise was repeated, and the dogs growled, and every hair stood up on their backs. "'Great God! Look here!' came from Donald. Following his glance, we saw, low down amongst the thick buffalo grass, the wild, haggard face of Doc Munro. His shock-red hair half covered his eyes, which glittered and glared like a lioness's. As we stood, he barked again, and made a jump out to the margin of the grass. He was mad, stark, staring mad, with delirium tremens. In one of his hands, half hidden by the grass, we could see a bushman's friend, and the bright blade seemed to catch an ugly gleam from the man's eyes, and reflect it malevolently back on us. Munro was a big man, and, although ruined in health by years of hard drinking, would have been a very ugly customer while the mad fit lasted, so we just stood our ground, ready to take him any way he wanted to come. After a minute or two he seemed to feel the effect of four pairs of eyes looking steadily at him, and the wild beast died out, and his body, which had been as rigid as a standing pointer's, became visibly limp and nerveless. He got up heavily, with a silly, hysterical laugh, and stood meekly before us, looking as foolish and harmless as a human being might. He sidled over towards Donald Mackay, keeping as far as possible from Gowan, whom he clearly distrusted, and looked furtively around, as though others besides us might hear him. He said, with a sickly smile, and in a thin, uncertain voice, "'I was plain, Donald, old man, only plain, you know me, old Doc Munro. You weren't frightened, Donald, hey? <laughs> I like to bark, you know. I like it, and who'll stop me if I like it, hey?' You could see I was plain, old partner. You knew it, didn't you? The man was wretchedly weak and shaky, and as he continued to look about anxiously, he wiped the drops of cold perspiration off his colourless face with the dirty strip of capellan, which did service for a pocket handkerchief. He sidled up closer and closer to Donald, and watched with growing intentness and terror the place from which he had just emerged. Mackay quietly imprisoned the knife-hand, but Monroe never noticed that, and only clung closer to him and began to mutter and cry out again, quivering with excitement and terror, which grew on him, until he shrieked to Donald to save him, and to knife him over there, pointing to the tree beneath which he had hidden. Key took the preferred knife, and walking quietly towards the tree, began to hack it in an unenthusiastic manner, and the relief that this seemed to give Monroe would have been ludicrous but for the desperate hopelessness it brought for poor old Saltka. It was no longer possible to keep up our well-intended fiction about the doctor requiring rest, for Monroe's maniac laughter and shrieks of terror became so frequent and awful that they must have startled one half a mile away. He became so violent that we were obliged to take him down to the spread, and to tie him down there in the shadow of a high bank, with one of the niggers to look after him, and an occasional visit from one of us to see if all was well. Saltka bore the news, as he had borne all that went before, with silent, martyr-like patience. He seemed to have guessed it. Not a muscle moved, 
not a feature changed. He listened to it as calmly as he listened to our expressed hope that the district surgeon would turn up by sundown, and with as little personal concern. Towards evening he spoke a good deal to us all, but in a way that made our hearts sink. He spoke of his home and his past life for the first time, and of something that was troubling him greatly. He also admitted that his leg was feeling very hot, and that he felt twinges of pain shooting up into the groin and body. At sundown he asked for his prayer book, and later on, when we had left him alone for a while, and sat in silent, helpless despair by the neglected fire, he asked for Robbie. At last, at about ten o'clock that night, we heard the welcome sound of a horse's trotting, and to our unspeakable delight, the cheery little doctor turned up. Poor old Saltka did brighten up then, and the smile which had never failed him throughout the days of suffering seemed to me more easy and hopeful. In less than an hour the shattered leg was off. In spite of the bad light and the rude appliances, all went well, and with infinite relief we saw Saltka doze off under the merciful influence of the morphia which the doctor had brought. We felt that we had rounded the turn, and could afford to sleep easy. The little doctor, who had ridden seventy miles since sun-up, rolled into his blankets near where Saltke slept, and was in the land of dreams long before we, who were restless from very relief and joy, and could settle down to close our eyes. I seemed to have dozed for but a few minutes, when, in my dreams as it seemed to me, I heard in the faintest but clearest whisper the doctor saying, Mortification! you know. I couldn't see it by candlelight, or we might have spared him the operation. He was just dead. He sighed himself out, as the doctor said, like a tired child to sleep. We buried him close to the road under the big thorn-tree, which we stripped of its bark for a couple of feet to serve for a headstone for his grave. It was the tree where we had seen him on his knees at prayer. And as it neared sundown, we called for the oxen, and inspanned for the evening trek. The doctor had gone. He had to get back those seventy miles to see another patient, whose life perhaps depended on the grit of his gallant little horse. During the night Monroe had managed to get loose, and with a madman's cunning had got away with his horse and disappeared, which was perhaps a good thing for him. The boys had packed everything on the wagons, and were lashing the bedding in the tent-wagon so as to be out of the way of the dust and the thorns, when one of them picked up and handed out to us the open book and writing materials, just as Saltke had left them three days before, when he had jumped out to shoot the blue jay. The diary lay open at the last written page, and we read, The most ferocious of reptile is the viper. Robbie closed the book gently and put it away. It didn't seem the least bit funny then. At midnight, when the long trek was over, and we were rolled in our blankets near the campfire, Robbie's heart was full, and he spoke, slowly and in half-broken tones. "'You mind the time he sent for me? You do? Yes. Well, it was to ask my forgiveness for what he said the day I struck him. Aye, he did that.' Robbie looked slowly round the circle through dimmed glasses, and then went on hesitatingly. And he said, too, that we had all been too good to him, and that he played it low on us, and that he, he hoped the good God would pardon him the greatest crime of all. And he said that I must give his prayer book and his zither. Robbie continued in a low and reverent tone. To, to his child his little boy. Saltke's child came from all together. Robbie nodded, and there was a space of time when every one shifted a little and felt chilled, but it was Gowan who put our common thought into words. Where is his wife? he asked slowly. Dad, said Robbie. I, I didn't know he was married. Robbie's look was a prayer for mercy as he answered. He wasn't. End of chapter 2